My husband, at first, he didn't think much of my involvement in the union. He was quite displeased with my involvement. And uh, at one point during negotiations, after being away 11 days, when I got home, he was real depressed and he asked to have a good talk. So I sat down with him and he told me to make my decision, neither to leave QP or leave him. And I said that no way would I leave QP. I would like to have a union. I thought of it once or twice, but um, I was told that uh, you don't speak about unions because some people that uh, had tried uh, a number of years ago were let go, whether it was for that reason or not. I don't know. I was afraid mostly that if I became too involved in the union that I could lose my job when I started back in 1959. Uh, I was uh, really a ringer. Uh, I just uh, was amazed. I just looked around. The crowd scared me to death. The mic scared me to death. And, I mean, you, you just you just stay still and you don't like to look around. Just like when you're going into an opera and you don't know which way to look. And uh, I think uh, most delegates feel the same way. Resolution number 20 is the resolution on page 3 of this buff-colored sheet. Okay, this morning, in this morning's session, it was referred back to the committee with the instructions to consider an amendment to it which would add a further resolve, which was found before, and I don't want to confuse you further, but the, but the amendment came from a resolution which was on the white sheets, and it was called resolution number 23, and on the bottom of it it said it was covered by resolution number 20, which is this one on the buff sheet. No. The recommendation was that the last resolve of that resolution number 23 be part of this new, this resolution number 20, which is before you. The committee did that, has brought it back. They now recommend concurrence as amended. Now, I don't know how much, you know, I can't explain it any more than that. I hope that's satisfactory, that everybody can follow that. Uh, I would like to be first. <laughs> you move me for a back? Women need to get together as women and decide what they want before they're ready to work with men. You have to form your ideas and your priorities as women. And you need the support of other women in order to deal with men. Something like this. Uh, if you have a separate women's meeting and the women all talk, and then you go into the group, the whole group of the men, and um, the same women that talked and had so much to say, and the women's group was scared, and you never heard them, with the men present. When I go through all these levels, then you can get a group together like Women's Federation, which can just come out and work for them directly. It seems like just one more um, step to go through. 
you know what you want. You want to change the capitalist system. You want equality for women outside the kind of roles that are presently available in this society for the men and women. Why not go for those directly? But I think that as working women, we have to recognize that the exploitation of women is a class question. That the saying. ruling classes exploit every section of the working class in particular ways. They have right. exploitation of immigrants. They're made to work for uh, low wages and bad conditions and, and have no rights. Right. Women workers are exploited in the same way. And that it's a class question and we can't rely on women executives to need working women. We have to recognize that it's class question and uh, we have to fight against that discrimination in the unions, through the unions. Brother Chairman, great start when I hate to come to the microphone again. I'd like to just zero in on one item that was in our original book on the status of women in QP. One area that we felt was badly neglected and we really wanted to do something about, and that was the elimination of the discrimination in salary between nursing assistants and orderlies. The traditionally low-paid nursing assistant in some areas are now earning as much as $11,232 per annum or $5.76 an hour. And in six provinces, they're earning exactly the same rate as an orderly. And those provinces are British Columbia, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Newfoundland. In Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, and in some Ontario hospitals, the nursing assistant earns more than the orderly. Right now, with this most recent settlement achieved in uh, Alberta, certified nursing assistants are earning $60 a month less than the male orderly. But there is an explanation for this, I think. They're in an independent association. They chose not to come into CUPE and they chose not to bargain jointly with us. They chose to go their own route. Hmm? In general, unions have the place. Uh, a large group of people need a few people to speak for them and to get their ideas across to management and powerful companies. But they don't have to be as strong and as powerful as they were back in the 30s. People aren't taken advantage of these days like they were before. They're more educated. I don't think they stand for any abuse. When a person works for a civic government, a provincial government, a federal government, they're always in the public's eye. They're always saying, oh, look at those uh, federal workers. They're getting that big raise, or the provincial or the city workers. They don't do anything. It's a real easy job to have. And I feel we have a responsibility for other people in unions to settle our contracts in the most dignified way we can with the least bit of um, dis disturbance to the public. Most people only hear about unions when a strike or a confrontation is involved. Whereas here in QP, 95% of our contracts are settled through negotiations without strike action. We had a very idealistic uh, scheme for negotiating. Uh, what we wanted to do was cut down on the hassling and backbiting within our union. And the way we did that was we decided that most of the backbiting and hassling was over why people earned more than other people for strange jobs like, um, let's see, uh, medical records, librarian assistant, okay, and receptionists. I mean, how do we equate those jobs? How do you say those jobs are of equal value? But in essence, one had a gut feeling about a certain kind of job that they were in a certain kind of, uh, that they deserve certain, uh, the same pay. Uh, we, had a di we had difficulty talking uh, about this to our members, especially the members who were earning the high wages. But eventually we uh, persuaded our union that this would uh, cut down on the backbiting and the hassling and we could present more of a united front to our manager. And uh, we eventually negotiated that. Um, I think our administrator at the time realized uh, that if we changed our classification code so it was more rational, uh, that that would make us more unified, and he bucked that. Uh, but in the end, we won. 
Uh, last year, previous, right before we started negotiating our contract, I uh, contact all the lab assistants and lab attendants throughout the province to forward to me a job description, their own words, what they are, what duties they are performing daily on their job. I specify do not contact your supervisor or whoever and ask them what jobs you're supposed to do. I want to know what you are doing. And I found again that many did not write down what they were doing. They immediately went to their supervisor. From meeting with them and speaking, they said, well, I do such and such, but I didn't bother putting it down because it could cause trouble. And uh, I figured if, you know, something came up about it, I could lose my job altogether, so I d I'm not going to say anything about it. And things like this here, but how do they expect us to help them? We want to know what these girls are doing. Then was probably one of the most dramatic strikes in Cupid's history because all of the forces that oppressed working people were brought into play. Six weeks after the strike began, the Prince Albert Hospital workers struck to support their demands. We were out for almost four weeks, and uh, that's when the infamous Bill 2 was passed. And uh, we had been on the picket line that night, and uh, we heard rumors that um, something was happening in Regina. So the next day, we were on the picket line. We had a radio with us, and we listened to the 1230 news, and we learned via the radio that we were to report back for work the following morning. We were forced back, and the arbitration board would be set up, and we would have to abide by the arbitration board's decision. The irony of it all was that what we had refused was better than what the arbitration board handed down to us. Then the Estevan strikers were forced to accept the same unsatisfactory settlement. We were forced to take oh, some 3%, some got 5%. We had some members who received nothing. Recently at a conference of hospital workers in Guelph, Professor Johnson of the Hospital Inquiry Commission of Ontario tried to convince our members that they should support compulsory arbitration. First of all, let's clear up this business about the right to strike. Ontario and Prince Edward Island are the only provinces in which hospital workers don't have the right to strike. And to talk about whether the uh, Commission had in its terms of reference to give us the right to strike is also quite misleading because until 1965 we had the right to strike. And in 1965, that right was taken away from us, not through anything that the hospital workers did, but because the management of the Trenton Memorial Hospital refused to bargain with the workers there. So who did they attack? They attacked the union. That's the first point. This, this, this is a nonsense that's being said about the right to strike. The second thing is that the Johnson Report deals quite concretely with compulsory arbitration. As Professor Johnson said, as other people have said, the purpose of the Commission was to make compulsory arbitration work. And our experience as hospital workers has been that compulsory arbitration works in the interest of the government and hospital management. And that compulsory, <laughs> compulsory arbitration can only work in the interest of the government and the hospital management. And there's no difference between the recommendations in the Johnson Commission and what we have now. Instead of a tripartite arbitration commission, we'll have three members from the union, three members from the management, and one from the government. <laughs> changes in the arbitration procedure? There's no changes that can be made that will make it acceptable to us. And the criteria for what is acceptable, Professor Johnson spoke quite a bit in his speech about what is appropriate settlement. What is appropriate settlement? What is acceptable? What we will settle for is exactly what is acceptable to ourselves. And the first thing that is not acceptable to ourselves is compulsory arbitration. And QB has gone on record to say that.
it's important that a doctor somebody who is entering a room in contract, it brings your staff closer together, you can have your facilities maybe on site. What I see as an ideal daycare is I would like to see it available to all ages where um, mom is in breastfeeding and that mom would be able to be allowed to, to take time off and, and, and go to the child. Uh, there are many other problems like when a child becomes ill, we have no daycare centers or no place to take our child. There is also nothing for um, shift workers or even part-time workers, they are called to come in immediately, like maybe given an hour notice. They have no place, they have to find a babysitter in that time and also be able to come to work. Like at times I would be asked to work overtime and I would have to refuse because the daycare center is closed at 6 and like it, it really puts pressure and anxiety on the person. What do they do? Where, where are you going to take your child? Or, or who's going to take them after 6? If, again, if you refuse overtime, you, you're liable to lose your job. My child is now out of daycare and I have a problem. My babysitter is not going to babysit, and I have no place to take my child in the summer for two months. What am I going to do? You too could have a child center. You can wear an MP child cap. I'd like to spend more time with some of them because uh, I know they don't have relatives or if they do they don't come and I don't know why but some people don't have relatives but uh, when a person wants to sit down and really, you know, talk to them or just show them that you, you care, you know, they're old people. They're going to be old someday too and I hope somebody sits down and talks to me when I'm, you know, there. Starting from the head, the temple, which you can go in like this, the eyes, which you can poke in, the nose, you can either smash down the bridge, or you can go. There was a time span last winter of about three weeks when there had been about seven attacks in our area. The library is just right at College and Beverly Street. And after a few weeks, women weren't coming to any of the QB uh, meetings. And the reason was that they were scared to go home in the evening around 11 o'clock by themselves. So we had um, done some looking into different self-defense courses and found the Amazon workshop gave a self-defense course in the evenings and we were located quite close to the library. So our union did pay for women at one to take the course and quite a few women did take the course. to take exception to the, this old business, this old myth of 
women working for pin money. I don't care what your husbands are making today. It's a hell of a hard time to make ends meet if you've got children and you're trying to put children through a school or a university. You need the second income. The Dominion government statistics prove that the majority of women that are working today are working for economic reasons. They're working because they have to work. They have to provide that extra money. Therefore, be it resolved that the Nebraska Federation of Labor petition the government to have job titles that would not relate to sex. And be it further resolved that a competition be marked open to both men and women. And be it further resolved that all application forms for positions be amended so as not to include the, application, the applicant's sex or marital status. This committee concurs with this resolution, and I so move. I second it. The point local 1191. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I agree with the resolution. However, what would happen, for instance, if they are posting jobs for jail guards or penitentiary guards, and there was no uh, you mean to say that a female could go to work at Dorchester Penitentiary doing the same job as the men, I think it would be impossible. And another thing is, is the, the fact that in places of employment, you may look, look at this very rather lightly if you like, but in places of employment you still have two washrooms, one for men and one for women. <laughs> but there are some jobs which cannot be filled by women. I think this is ridiculous. If uh, anyone can do a job, a woman could do it too. Whatever a man can do, a woman can do it, if they, they're qualified to do it. And I don't think, no matter if the position was posted, a woman wouldn't apply for it. She didn't feel she could do it. So uh, why not give her a chance? Don't say that it's impossible. Nothing is impossible with a woman. And we're going to have to take a hard look at our own uh, staff, where we have only four female representatives out of 115. I'm looking forward to the time when we will have a lot more applications from uh, qualified women who can fill these representatives' jobs. I was quite serious about applying for a job with um, QP at one time. It was sort of my dream um, to become a union rep. And uh, I was told, yeah, I would be really very good at that, and that's the kind of women they needed. And uh, But the problem was, when it came down to negotiations, what they really wanted was somebody who could make the boss crap their pants, and they didn't think that women could do that. Well, I found that I was able to make my boss crap his pants in most situations without any difficulty. Um, I found myself really credible in a negotiating setup. Um, I think... Uh, I think had I been male, it wouldn't have done anything um, to change the situation. I am the president of a local with over 600 women, with 200 men. I have challenged the women time and time again to run for office. If there were one to run for president of that organization, I would support her or any other office. They don't want it. You're beating a dead horse. It's damned hard to get mileage out of a dead horse. I'm here because it's a beginning and it's a start, okay? And that maybe that I'll be able to encourage other women to participate through my role. And if I have to do it as the bloody reporting secretary of the division, I'll do it that way. If I can get to be vice president or president, fine. But I don't see that coming to a good end <laughs> Here in London at Local 101, QP, we organized the baseball team this uh, spring. It's really been our first chance to do anything along this line. We had a lot of younger employees start with the city, which has made it much easier for us to uh, have enough to participate. And it's meant a lot as far as involvement with the union. The team is considered QP, and the girls are more anxious now to participate in other things as well. 
organized uh, education sessions that were not in a big hall um, or not in, in a cold meeting room, but instead were in the in homes of, of different local members. We also started pushing grievances. Uh, Every local in the world can find a grievance. Uh, it's very, very easy. Uh, and uh, we started really policing our contract. Uh, there is no such thing as a union meeting without well over 50% of our membership attending now. What you do with a member, um, female who is married and is delegated to go to a convention, but the husband says no. How do you deal with that? Okay, the problems of, of uh, women's activity in, in unions, one of the basic problems is the problem of how to deal with the family because of the traditional family roles that the mother sh should be home uh, caring for her children uh, after she, she's through her work day, uh, that she should be home making meals for her tired husband who has also finished his work day and the like. And it's been a real problem for me. John? Can you stay home with the kids tonight? I have a union meeting. Yeah, I found a Sam to help him with his boat. But somehow women have to come to terms with the fact that they have the right to do things outside of the home that they care about deeply. All men have the right to do it. It was the women that were strong in Estevan when we walked the picket line for three months. The men were weakening on us, and we had to do all sorts of things to shore them up and, and keep their spirits up. One man threatened that he was going to go back in to work, and he said, If you dare, just try it. We'll catch you in the alley, and we'll pull your clothes off. And then you see. And let's not forget our sisters out at the west coast who walked that picket line for something like two years and there was no man there. To three years, sister? I knew it was a long time. I didn't know just how long. And there was no man there to help them. And they did it on their own. And unless we do assert ourselves and demand our rights and stand for office and be heard, not just fill a chair, but be heard, we'll never get anywhere. Thank you. Thank you.